Okay, hi everybody, and uh, welcome to our session. Um, today we're going to be talking to you about the Open Programmable Infrastructure Project and telling you about um, what we're trying to do there and the goals and objectives. Uh, during it, uh, we'll go through some interesting technology pieces as well. Uh, my name is Mike Lynch. Uh, I'm a Senior Director of Networking in Intel. I'm joined by Shakir. Hi, everybody. I'm Shakir Caesar. I'm one of the principal architect within NVIDIA on the DPU project. So, so what is the Open Programmable Infrastructure Project, or OPI for short? So the objective is to foster a community-driven, standards-based open ecosystem for next-gen architectures and frameworks based on DPU and IPU technologies. Right. So, so for those of you in the audience with a, a networking background, uh, you've probably heard of these terms before, uh, DPUs and IPUs, data processing units and infrastructure processing units. They're basically devices with very, very similar characteristics. Um, Shakir will go through uh, some of that in, uh, in a few minutes' time and go into some more of the details. Um, but think of, them, think of them as essentially cutting edge, really are cutting edge, uh, networking devices that can be deployed um, across cloud infrastructure, uh, but also across um, uh, across uh, uh, other workloads and um, uh, and places in the network, not just in in pure cloud uh, environments. So, the project is brand new. Uh, it's only been formed since uh, June June twenty twenty second. It was uh, it was officially formed, and it's part of the Linux Foundation. Um, you can see the founder members here on this slide, so it's a, it's a good cross-section of device vendors, and you've got myself from Intel and Shakir from NVIDIA here, um, but also across OS vendors, Red Hat, cross-server OEMs, Dell, um, testing vendors like Keysight, um, but also end users or, or cloud service providers like Tencent, uh, and solutions providers in the, in the telco world like, like ZTE. So, so quite a good cross-section of the ecosystem participating. Um, and these are just the, um, the founding members at the premier level. There is a, a bunch more um, companies and individuals participating and contributing as well. Um, we also have a number of, of folks at the general membership tier. Even in the last couple of weeks, we've had Dream Big Semiconductor, Solid Run, and Unifabrics join the project. Uh, so that's very encouraging. So um, we're just kicking off. So really what we want to try and get across to you today is you know, what it's all about and why it's really important um, and to gauge interest and, and participation. So I'm gonna hand over to Shakir now just to segue into some of the technical aspects. Thank you, Michael. I think it is important to understand a little bit the history of uh, DPUs and IPUs and also the core components, how it's evolved to appreciate the OPI project, because I, I think the evolution of the NIC technology basically demanded the need for an OPI. So before I go more in detail on the technical side, I think um, with the data centers and demand for uh, elastic uh, use of computing and uh, effective utilization of resources, the ISPs already started experimenting beyond NICs. So basically they put some FPGAs to encrypt data, to do IPsec or even um, tunnels. Uh, later they introduced uh, disaggregation of storage to be effectively utilized and so on. We have seen several projects been introduced over five, six, seven years by Amazon and by Microsoft. Most of these technologies were based on uh, standard NIC with an FPGA. And over time, with putting larger FPGAs, this type of NICs became st uh, smart NICs. And here you can see in this diagram uh, uh, how this uh, smart NICs worked. So we have the top to serve architecture, we have the user application, bare metal operating systems uh, running on top of the CPU, and then we have the PCIe. Beneath the PCIe, we have accelerators, and these accelerators need drivers, again, on the CPU side to take full advantage. Beneath, we have the NIC, and so on. As you can see, 
most ISPs custom build the solution, so off the shelf was a bit difficult to be deployed, and most companies first introduced that, look, you can buy a, uh, a smart NIC with an FPGA, you download your IP yourself. So there were, for example, business models where uh, uh, suppliers of smart NICs uh, were talking about uh, hardware IP and drivers on top on software where uh, basically customers can tailor the smart NIC for their needs. But with increased performance and complexity, this cannot be sustained. Also, the programming paradigm was complicated. You basically had different vendors with different IBs supplying different um, uh, functions. So overall, the evolution was how we can basically evolve this type of technology to better improve our infrastructure, but decouple. Decouple from uh, the upper layers means that we do have a here a uh, basically standard layer. Beneath, we still have the drivers and uh, um, computing resources, ARM cores, that basically do the processing in collaboration with the I with the hardwired IP, so accelerators, and provide the services. So the solution of IPUs and DPUs evolved from smart NICs, but the performance that uh, state-of-the-art DPUs and IPs offer is beyond what smart NIC could ever offer. On top, the ability to software-defined programmability and ability to have a shim layer to make this programmable means standard programmable by um, uh, basically having different vendors uh, providing the hardware and on top with the software that has been provided having a standard interface uh, to the application running on top. Let's look at bit the technologies themselves. So this is an uh, off-the-shelf diagram illustrating what the components of a uh, um, DPU IP is comprised of. Usually, we do have a PCIe because this is the way how it's been connected to the host. On the right-hand side, we do have the network interface. In between, there are s uh, switches. The switches allow you basically to softly define the way how you steer the traffic to potential VMs or different hosts on the same platform. But also, it allows you to program uh, policies, how the steering is happening. So the common language being widely used is P4, and many uh, vendors do have uh, P4 programmable or, um, uh, or open flow programmable data paths uh, dealing with the steering. In addition, we have ARM or MIPS cores, but at the moment, I think, the industry has settled with ARM cores. Even Intel is using ARM in this particular case. Um, this is the computing resources that give you the flexibility and where you can run a complete uh, software stacks, including an operating system. And that basically the uh, ability to do a lot of workloads you would do on a CPU where you outsource to, this, uh, to the NIC. Uh, this could be, for example, the hypervisor. And then in addition, which differentiates um, uh, the smart NIC is uh, that you do have accelerators. The accelerator are important. When you want to do this type of workloads on a CPU, the computing resource can be significant. So because this is dedicated to infrastructure, the use cases are limited. In this case, you can now deploy hardware accelerators to achieve uh, hundreds of gigabits. Now, latest DPU targeting 400 gigabit and 800 gigabit. And this type of uh, performance, you can't uh, not achieve purely with software. This includes, obviously, uh, protocols from NVMe over TCP offload over Rocky and also part of the P4 pipeline itself, also inline microprocessor for HBM. On another side, secure to become more dominant and more important because we have to isolate different flows from different VMs. We have to ensure isolation, but we also uh, uh, deploy, in addition to isolation, capabilities uh, uh, like uh, 
uh, monitoring policing policy enforcement. Uh, we have to check the integrity. So these accelerators that has been widely used include crypto, uh, crypto engines for public key and private key, regular expression for pattern matching to inspect intrusion and intrusion prevention, and hashing to check integrity that, for example, VM images are not modified or changed. So looking at now uh, use cases, uh, it is every vendor out there has certain uh, spot where they focus the DPU, IPU, specifically the most dominant area has been storage, so implementation of storage offload and the ability to, to attach um, uh, solid state, disk, uh, so solid state uh, uh, um, devices onto the store, um, smart NIC. Uh, but another use cases include network security, like intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, but also the ability to introduce the uh, um, confidential computing to provide the necessary uh, isolation to ensure confidentiality. Uh, is enough computing power in terms of the MIPS or ARM cores that you can deploy gateways and deploy basically routing capabilities uh, within these devices. And uh, finally, because of the um, computing resource you have, you can even uh, run your hypervisor, the control plane of the hypervisor completely on this ARM cores, basically enabling the CPUs and the memory on the uh, host themselves to be fully utilized for workloads. So there is limitless. Uh, these devices are standalone devices. They are not only can be used in, with a server, but you can use the device on its own and uh, remotely log in, and they're on its own rights. They are computers, and because of their accelerators capabilities, they can also be used for appliances as well and for another type of each computing devices, and because of this capability, you may want to attach GPUs on these devices or uh, um, also AI processing capabilities. It doesn't need to be purely CPU. So as you can see from evolution from a standard NIC, a new family of technologies evolved, and this technology is called IPUs and DPUs, and this technology is primarily targeted for the data center infrastructure, but has beyond these capabilities to be widely used in other areas as well. So we can see over the next decade, when software fully implemented on top of these platforms in a unique manner, in a way that we can basically, under OPI, uh, standardize the APIs that user uses, I think the use case can be even wider, in particular in a distributed edge computing nodes as well as in large data centers. Thanks, Shikhar. Thank you. So, so with that introduction about the technology uh, by Shakir, um, so why are we here again uh, in terms of why do we want to foster an open community around this technology? Um, really it's because it's First of all, it's super complicated. It's super advanced. Um, this technology has its genesis, I guess, and worked on by the major hyperscalers over the last five, seven years. Um, practically all of them, you know, from Amazon to you know, some of the guys in China to, to Microsoft to others, have deployed um, IPU, DPU type technology in various guises, Pro mainly proprietary guises, in some instances, mer merchant. Um, uh, DPUs, IPUs as well, um, in their own public clouds. And, and for very particular reasons, I mean, they obviously like, you know, want to clearly delineate between you know, the infrastructure that they have and what is happening with respect to tenants that they're, that they're hosting you know, uh, on their servers. And you know, they have a obviously strong desire you know, to control, control that environment top to bottom, right? Um, and of course, you know, because of the nature of their business, they're uniquely positioned to do that by themselves. They don't have to depend on a supply chain or an ecosystem to support them or to, to work with. They essentially can do it themselves. And 
you know, so therefore, you know, they have the ability to really, you know, deploy this technology, optimize it, fine tune it um, end to end, you know, and, uh, and from their perspectives, they've been able to successfully do that, right? Um, that's not the case outside the major hyperscalers. Outside um, for the rest of the world, you know, be it, you know, parts of the enterprise domains or, or in the telco domains, you know, there is an existing supply chain, you know, through um, from end customers down to server OEMs and silicon providers uh, like ourselves. And we all need to work together, right? And um, therefore, it's much more of a more complicated tapestry to get right. And, you know, there's, there's also um, a few things that have to be lined up or put in place in terms of requirements before this technology can deploy at scale, right? Um, as I said, it's complicated. And you've got to stitch together various elements of the supply chain you know, to make it happen. So we have a few things here like, you know, that are mandatory uh, for, the, for the broader ecosystem to, to address uh, in terms of those requirements. Uh, so first of all, um, what we want to see is you know, an open, democratized ecosystem without vendor lock-in. You know, the traditional supply chain is, is very much characterized by the necessity of dual supply or multi-vendor supply. That's going to be a necessity for the deployment of this type of technology as well, right? Uh, and that's for, to ensure we keep costs in check and reduce costs and TCO for adoption of technology over time. It's really, really important. So that's number one. The second thing is that application portability is key. So, so customers um, who have spent a lot of money in terms of um, legacy software and applications over the years, you know, they have to maintain um, uh, an ROI in that and be able to port that, that investment um, through future generations um, of, of, their own, um, of their own releases, but also upon like, you know, whatever new generations of, of hardware that they want to deploy upon. So that needs to be a migration path to be supported. So those, um, those set of customers today, you know, particularly over the last you know, 10 years, for example, if you take NFE or Network Functions Virtualization as an example, they've, they've deployed applications and Network Functions based on a, you might call it a, a standard infrastructure, you know, consisting of you know, server-based networking you know, and standard, standard NICs, right? And they're quite tightly bound, as Shakir said. Right, um, so, but they need to be offered a way to migrate those applications to DPU and IPU type technology. Um, and the type of acceleration services then that they wish to avail of, you know, need to be transparent in the sense of infrastructural acceleration that they wish to adopt, be it for underlying crypto capabilities or underlying uh, support for storage use cases or Kubernetes acceleration. Um, use cases or general networking use cases. That needs to be transparent in terms of um, how the application software accesses those and leverages those. Um, but also, at the application layer itself, there may be some apps in the network that we refer to as network functions. They too might wish to um, avail of acceleration capabilities you know, through offloading portions of the application. Right? That could be, for example, a piece of a firewall you might want to offload or a, a network function like a user plane function in the telco world. Again, the interfaces that those applications leverage to, to facilitate that need to, be, um, need to be open and need to be standard or, 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 or pseudo standard. <clears throat> and, and on this aspect here, last but not least on this one, um, the validation effort that, that um, particularly customers in the you know, in the, uh, in the TEM space, you might want to call them like, you know, the network equipment vendors, the Ericsson's, the Nokia's of the world, Cisco's of the world. <clears throat> the validation effort that they need to um, apply when they're consuming this technology needs to be minimized. You know, what do I mean by that is that, you know, they, they have, again, they've invested so much in their, in their own software uh, uh, and they want to maintain that investment. Uh, they don't want to be having to validate, you know, next generation of software on different vendor devices, be it an Intel device, NVIDIA, Marvell device. You know, that's going to incur a, um, a penalty, really, like that's going to be unsustainable in the, in the longer term in terms of meeting a TCO. 
So they want to be able to validate against the set of standard APIs you know, that is common across um, multiple vendor hardware. That would be a general goal. Then in terms of, of software, um, software not just in, in the sense of you know, portable software stacks and SDKs that vendors provide, again, which has to be quite sophisticated from firmware you know, through to drivers, through to orchestration, through to manageability capabilities, not just in terms of those SDKs that need to be developed and enhanced and supported gen on gen across vendor devices, um, but remember, those devices have to be qualified in, in major server OEM hardware, right? Uh, they have to be uh, validated in, in OS vendor distributions. You know, so again, there's a rich tapestry of, of ecosystem alignment that has to take place. Uh, and all has to be choreographed across timelines and releases. So that has to happen. And lastly, the TCO. I mean, all, and all these things feed into, into a TCO. Um, but again, you know, particularly in the, in the telco world, I mean, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a constrained environment in terms of balance sheets generally. And you know, there's, um, there's often there's, there's severe pressure on costs and, and bottom lines. So if the technology won't cost in versus what they have today in terms of traditional infrastructure, it's going to be very difficult you know, to see it adopted. You know, so, so all these things you know, need to come together. And you know, that's, why, that's why we're here really in terms of trying to form this community and see it evolve. And because if we don't, unfortunately, like, you know, we'll be in a situation where the adoption of the technology will be pretty sporadic. It'll be niche-like and it'll be difficult to adopt, right? So, so that really is the, the raison d'etre, the rationale for, for the, the OPI community or the open programmable infrastructure community. So, so I've got a few slides about how the, the project is, is structured. You know, so at a high level, the, the main objectives are, number one, to reduce the variation across different implementations, you know, so we don't want to have you know, different ways or, or a bunch of different APIs or interfaces by which you stand up a networking use case uh, on this technology, or a storage use case, or how security is handled, or how provisioning um, and lifecycle is managed for a DPU. We want common approaches here. Um, we want to reuse standard uh, APIs that, that exist already in the industry. We, want, we don't want to start from scratch. There's already like, you know, great investment and progress and value um, in existing frameworks, DPDK being a, being a great example. Um, you know, we want to leverage those where we can. And we want to recycle any best practices that exist out there today uh, where it makes sense. You know, again, um, best practices when it comes to, e.g., programmability. These devices are extremely sophisticated in their programming capabilities. Um, so whether that's like, you know, tools around specific domain, specific languages like, like P4, uh, or whether it's like a common schema for manageability, these are things we want to, to see put in place. <clears throat> and lastly here, um, a key goal of the project will be to provide implementation examples, reference platforms, so that we validate what we're doing. It can't just be a, a place where we come up with um, API definitions. Uh, it needs to be a place where we put them into practice, where we can test out um, use cases against the APIs that we, we do develop um, and prove them out. You know, so one of, the, uh, one of the goals of the project would be to have a, you know, a, vibrant, a vibrant developer effort, a vibrant lab effort, um, and testing and so on, you know, such that we can you know, really test and, and, um, and ensure like, you know, that, the <coughs> that the overall solutions are working. So lastly, so, you know, there's three things I think you know, that are key uh, to, the, to the project itself. We want to be able to independently boot and provision the DPUs. I mean, that's a, a key thing that we want to see accomplished with the technology. Um, we want to ensure we have that security air gap between the infrastructure and, and the host, um, the tenants are running on, on the host uh, inf uh, environment. Uh, to do that, like, you, know, you need to be able to separate out the, the lifecycle and the provisioning of the IPU and DPU uh, from, from what's happening in the host and the host BMC. Then we want to be able to um, provide the capability to program and operate 
technology and by that, in terms of the project, we want to drive POCs, we want to be able to drive um, uh, use cases, we want to be able to drive test cases, etc. And lastly, we just want to be able to stand up those use cases end to end. Um, it's not probably, it's not going to be enough just to kind of have pieces of the answer. Um, we need to be able to showcase, for example, a storage use case end to end, right? So that, uh, so that users can see the value and can be able to stand up an example out of the box. Similarly for, for networking, you know, for if one of the goals of the project, for example, would be to provide an accelerated <coughs> offload capability for Kubernetes networking, right? Um, it's not enough just to provide the, the schema or the high-level architecture for that. We want to be able to prove it out. Okay. Overall structure of OPI it would be very similar to what you see in other projects. We have a board of directors um, and an adjunct from that. We have an outreach committee focused on marketing. We have a technical steering committee or TSE, which then runs the, the main technical sub-projects um, of OPI. Um, right now we've got four of those and they're kind of aligned to what we've been talking about. We have a provisioning and lifecycle uh, work group which is focused on what it says, provisioning, um, discovery, um, boot sequencing, uh, upgrades, and, and metrics and telemetry as well, right? Super important. And uh, then we have uh, API and behavioral models also super important because essentially these are the, the set of common APIs that the project needs to develop to be able to abstract away from the underlying vendor SDKs. So Intel has a vendor SDK, NVIDIA has a vendor SDK, so does Marvell, other, other device vendors. Um, but a key objective is that we have an abstracted layer above that um, such that you know, customers and, and the broader ecosystem can onboard to you know, without having to get into the specifics of of each vendor uh, implementation. So we have an API and behavioral model uh, work group focusing on that. Uh, then we have use cases. Um, so again, we're focusing primarily on storage, networking, and security in the first instance. Um, those use cases like you know, will need to land somewhere, so therefore we have a developer platform work group as well, which is designed to ultimately stand up a, a community lab in OPI. Um, similar to, to, other, to other places where we can run our CICD um, from a testing per, uh, perspective, but also where we can have you know, full uh, developer access as well uh, for the community, like to, to see these use cases implemented on, on real hardware and ensure that the, the APIs that we're developing are, are functional. Right? Ultimately, that would evolve into what I think would be a, a reference architecture uh, for, uh, for the OPI community itself. So, so that's the, the main structure. I mean, so around those um, working groups, you know, we have you know, a, a vision work group, we have minimum requirements work group as well. Um, there's an orientation work group for folks who are onboarding into the project. You know, so, so these are nothing surprising. These are, these are support uh, work groups to the main body of the, uh, of the project. Uh, from an Intel perspective, uh, we have contributed uh, a project called the Imp uh, Infrastructure Programmer Developing, uh, Developer Kit, or IPDK. Uh, it's now a formal sub-project of OPI. And what our objective here is to do is just contribute our learnings uh, that, that we have across in the space to the broader community. And I think NVIDIA has uh, some plans there too. Exactly. Uh, obviously, on top of DBTK, we have open source interfaces and linked to DBTK in other open source um, platforms. So internally, we are in the development of such a platform as well that we basically contribute to the project. Yeah. Okay, so how you participate? Well, you know, it's, you know, join the project. I mean, so there's an orientation work group in there, you know, that you can access via, um, access via like, you know, uh, the, uh, through the website, through the GitHub. We've got all the links for that in, in a couple of minutes. Um, and join the Slack channels, you know, so it's very easy just to onboard yourself and uh, get involved in the mailing lists, uh, understand, you know, areas that are important to you and important to your companies, 
Um, so please um, have a look around and see like, you know, what is of interest here. Uh, when we are looking back in the history, um, there were a generation of NPUs, and NPUs were introduced, one of the leading companies, obviously, in Intel. But they haven't taken off. And I see the DPU being a generation to reinvent and uh, basically make this NPU era more successful. When we're looking at the NPUs, they're meant to accelerate network processing. Now we know more about network processing. Network has become infrastructure. We call it now infrastructure processors. Obviously, we learned a lot over the time dealing with these protocols. And I think the main failure of NPUs were their lack of common programming paradigm. Every vendor has their own language. Every vendor has its own programming uh, direction. Uh, we don't want this to happen to DPUs or IPUs as well. There is massive demand, and the infrastructure needs to be accelerated. The infrastructure has to be dealt with accelerator and custom computing. And I think the DPU provides this type of needs in a more efficient way from a power dissipation perspective, cost perspective. perspective. And what needed is that the community come together and then build up a platform that makes a community adopted approach where vendors like ourselves uh, produces silicon, but um, it, the community itself defines how to uh, program it. So what we can take away, there is massive demands from many customers. Uh, in, in my role as an architect, I have been engaged with big players, small players, and there is huge interest because the evolution, building your own silicon by some companies is not possible anymore. There is only a handful of companies can build silicon. Using FPGs have been always challenging. And here for the networking world, I think the DPUs and IPUs offer huge massive opportunities. But this customers that we engage with always asking for the programming uh, portability and all this. I think there is a massive move. What we need to do is together uh, basically make the programming around uh, open programming and open APIs together work uh, with more participating in the OPI project and uh, succeed what we failed with MPUs. Well said, Shikhar. So with that, folks, um, that wraps up our presentation. So again, we would encourage you to, to look into the project and definitely consider contributing. It's easy to participate. You know, the links are here in the presentation to the mailing lists and to the Slack channels. And you can join the, join the community meetings. Uh, easy to contribute on, on GitHub. Everything is, is laid out. And, um, and lastly, we'd encourage you know, folks here from your respective companies to actually join the, pro join the, uh, the project. Um, at the Linux Foundation, because you know, without the funding afforded through the through the membership, like we wouldn't be here. So, so thank you all. Any uh, any questions from folks regarding the presentation? Yes.
even in GDR, we did have a hard time to adapt it to simpler um, NPUs and network processing units because the PKR students with the virtual memory and whatnot mm -hmm. limits, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what is your vision how to accommodate it? Because it, it, it sounds like you would like to have some kind of open CL standard for basically for uh, network computing, which is very ambitious, and I would love to see it, but uh, it's it's challenging from from what I see. You want me to add? Yeah, Shigeru, okay. do you want to try that? Yes. Uh, or maybe try and uh, summarize the question first. It was a broad question, but a good one. Okay, the question is about, uh, obviously there are different vendors with wide range of uh, technologies being put on DPUs. So obviously data pass processing for the packet processing, accelerators we talked about, GPUs and AI cores for potential AI deployment within the DPU and general purpose processing. And the diversity is massive and obviously everybody trying to show off with certain niche markets and niche use cases. How are we in a world going to combine uh, this type of technologies? And I fully agree with you. Um, I always give the example between homogeneous computing and heterogeneous computing. Homogeneous computing is great because it's all the same unit and you can program GPUs, CPU cores. And, but if you want to deploy acceleration, you can't get away without accelerators. So you have to deploy accelerators, you have to deploy custom computing. So on the DPUs are, from, from my, as an architect, it's a heterogeneous platform. And programming heterogeneous platform is a big, big nightmare because one programming paradigm doesn't apply. I agree. But there is another way to do that, and you highlighted, obviously, the general purpose pro uh, processors. Uh, you do have a general purpose processors acting as an interface. And our experience, if a custom accelerators, very neural function custom accelerators, we don't need to program these accelerators. We only have an API. So everybody will implement this type of function like crypto <coughs> offload in a way that will have open interface like uh, you know, kernel-based uh, TLS, KTLS has been one of them. So every vendor has his own accelerator, but they try to implement T the KTLS in a way to achieve acceleration and higher throughput. I think going forward, I think we will see evolution. And I think if you not start working and make our hands dirty, we will not see this evolution. And this evolution will be twofold. General purpose processing will be providing the standard interfaces. Beneath, we will have programmable data paths. Probably P4 will be the most, most dominant uh, programming language to program the data path. And then we have the accelerators and we have the AI. Again, on the AI side, AI is going to have probably a common interface or your program, TensorFlow is probably one of them. And then you have the accelerators. And from an accelerator perspective, I see this to be a bunch of APIs. So there will be APIs. If you don't have the accelerator, the software will deliver it at a slower pace. Yes. Crypto, yeah. Yep. Exactly. It, yeah. it will evolve, more standards will come, but in between you will see APIs that one vendor offer you will not find on another vendor. And the conclusion out of this is, uh, is this vendor, if they don't have the necessary accelerators, they will provide a software version running on an ARM course. It will be slower, but you still have the same interface. And over time, this vendor will may, in the next generation, introduce these accelerators. I think it will evolve. I agree, but I think it is an evolutionary process, and uh, the programming paradigm will be the uh, general purpose processor, the Linux interface, and probably the P4. These are the two things I see. The rest will be more API-based accelerators. Yeah, I 100% actually agree with what Shakir said there. Um, so, I mean, again, you have to cater for legacy, you know, so we have, you know, 10 or 12 years of folks using or building DPDK type applications. You know, if they want to come onto this technology, like the, you have to find a way to onboard them. It's just a reality. So, you know, APIs like, you know, 
RT flow or is it going to be important in a DPU, IPU type context? Um, I think there are agreed that there are some use cases that are a bit more um, uh, uh, conducive uh, to, to getting more commonality in terms of implementation. I think security is a good one. Storage is a good one as well. Um, and you know, with respect to networking, maybe things like uh, Kubernetes or common alignment around Kubernetes type offload uh, could be done too. So if, if folks um, concentrated around those, and to Shakira's point, you know, it's, it's difficult to program these devices in the hardware, right? So initially, like, you know, software is going to be the way to go. You've got, like, you know, um, you know, very beefy core subsystems on these devices now, right? Like, you know, to be able to put in place a software implementation that works, right? While over time, you evolve to, you know, the type of uh, domain-specific language, like, you know, e.g. P4, that will emerge, like, you know, to, as a common way to program the, you know, the pipelines across different uh, across different vendors and using a, an agreed uh, upon schema and, and tool chain, right? But that's, again, but it's going to take time. It's going to take time. So I think you know, diversity is there. You can't get away from it. So it's going to evolve. It's going to take a bit of a journey. One question we have been flagged up with a red flag up. <laughs> One question. At the moment, it's not possible. Obviously, every DPU has its own software stack and uh, function. But long term, I think with this uh, um, OPI project is uh, to democratize means common APIs, common function. And I think it's going to be like, um, you know, everybody will offer 70, 80% what OPI is putting. Mm -hmm. And then the remaining 20, 30% is something you differentiate from your competitor. You know, but if you, uh, somebody who wants a second source, they will stick to the 70% what has been offered as common and ignore the uh, vendor specific function. And then there will be niche markets where the uh, um, customer don't care over a second so, uh, source and they will basically take advantage of this unique features like in having an AI engine on it. You know, obviously they may want to do deploy the DPU as part of the H, you know, cloud H with 5G, next gen is 6G. So I think, uh, I don't think there will be unique one common platform, everything. Everybody has to differentiate itself from their competitor, has to have a competitive advantage. But if you not get 80%, 70% common, uh, it, it, um, customers will not be happy. Thank you for everybody.